Perry Marshall here just published this paper in progress in biophysics and molecular biology. It's called Biology Transcends the Limits of Computation. And the reason I wrote this paper was I needed a, an opportunity and a platform to explain in full painstaking detail um, the logic and the implications of all of the work I've done up to this point. $10 million Evolution 2.0 prize, the book itself. And what does this actually mean? Well, to understand this fully, you have to go back and ask the question, why did the world need a paper like this in the first place? And how is it that the science profession literally got cause and effect backwards for a hundred years? Because I'm completely serious. This is, this is what has happened. Well, you know, guys like Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett, Dawkins, very famous atheist, Dennett, uh, also very famous atheist, and one of the most famous philosophers in the world, um, basically turned neo-Darwinism into a pop religion over the last 30 or 40 years. And, um, you know, neo-Darwinism says, well, you know, you got your DNA, and there's random copying errors, and sometimes they're good, and most of the times they're bad, but they don't have to be good very often, and the natural selection picks those, and, you know, everything just gets better and better and better. And it makes a very nifty story that's easy to explain, and a lot of people will accept at face value. Uh, and, um, and like, well, there you go. Uh, we, we got rid of God. We got rid of all these creation stories. Now we can get on with science. Science has triumphed over religion once again, and you just have this, this narrative. Um, except there's a problem, which is that's not actually how it works. It, it works quite differently than that. Now, there's a book that came out about 25 years ago. It's called Darwin's Dangerous Idea by Daniel Dennett. And it's one of the first books I read when I really went down this rabbit hole. And at the beginning of the book, Dennett says, if you have replication, variation, and selection, you're going to have evolution. And it's pretty much that simple. And then he goes on for like 400 pages, having made this assumption that therefore we, you know, we were overturning civilization, we're overturning religion, all this kind of stuff. Um, well, if you get technical with these guys, their work is terrible. It is, the scholarship is abysmal. Um, the Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins and The Blind Watchmaker, uh, they make egregious errors. And like Dennett's book um, is, is based on a fundamentally wrong assumption. You don't, you don't get evolution just because you have random copying errors. You need incredible sophistication for anything to evolve the way a bacteria does. In fact, we don't even know how to make anything that evolves the way a bacteria does. Not even close. So what's the payoff of a belief system like this? Well, the payoff is, is it excuses you from answering or even asking all of the hard questions. Because if you face the questions honestly, what you really find is that we've only begun to scratch the surface of how the world and the universe actually work. And we really don't understand most of it. And, uh, you know, have you got rid of God? Well, no, not at all. Um, what you find when you really dig into it is that these questions are deeper than anybody can imagine. And what bothered me about this wasn't the religious side of me. Um, this, it, it was the engineer. The engineer in me was aghast 
at how badly these guys butchered the science. Or, you know the story of Procrustes? He's the, the guy in Greek mythology who, um, if, if somebody was too short for the bed, he would put them on the rack and stretch them, and if the, their legs were too long for the bed, he would just cut them off. This is what these guys did to science and engineering to fabricate a story to make Darwinism into this pop religion um, where, where you'd have thousands of people just mindlessly repeating this story like a bumper sticker slogan. And so what I had to do was make it impossible for a story like this to survive because this is killing us. Like, it is this sort of story, when, when it becomes the foundation of biology, this is why you're completely unable to cure cancer. This is why you, you can't even define it or understand it. This is why you end up defining it as a hundred different things instead of having some kind of a, a coherent definition. And so this had to be challenged. Um, really, the, the first way that I saw of addressing this was the prize because it's really easy to explain to Homer Simpson that there's this prize and it asks this question and nobody's won it. And it makes it very clear whether or not the questions have been answered. But again, uh, going, going back to the central theme of, of this little talk uh, we're having right now, um, What's the payoff for reversing cause and effect in biology? It takes a whole bunch of hard, thorny, uncomfortable, difficult questions and just puts them under anesthesia and sweeps them under a rug. But here's the thing. Questions don't go away. They just keep knocking and they keep knocking and they keep knocking. And every time another person dies of cancer or every time there's another virus and we can't really figure out where it came from, um, these questions are knocking at our door. And you know what? I just think it's better to ask them. And my career and my contribution to science isn't so much answers, it's questions. And we need to squarely address and face the questions. And it yeah, it takes courage.